earlier the bishop was saying, is this about the right length of time? Is this about the right length of time? We must have an inbuilt something because we're just, you know, coming to the exact right time for, for near the end of our service. We're, go we're going to talk about one last hymn and we'll sing that and then, um, and then I'll ask the bishop to just lead us in a, a prayer and the blessing right at the end and then we'll walk to the back and we'll meet people and I think there are refreshments as well at the back of church after the service so we can have a, a chat then hopefully you'll be able to stay for a few minutes and uh, people can quiz you a little more on your, your hymns. So um, now the last hymn you, you spoke about your father earlier on um, in uh, when you were saying about his ministry and uh, this particular hymn uh, relates to, to him particularly. Now, now thank we all our God. So would you like to, to say a little bit about that? It was his favourite hymn. Um, when Rachel and I were married by my dad, we had it at our wedding and we had it at my father's funeral, which I took. And believe you me, taking a pair, I took my mother's funeral as well. And uh, it's quite something to do that. It's quite something to do that. So, God bless you, Ruth, with all the funerals you take. I always think every person who takes a funeral deserves a medal afterwards. And uh, uh, you speak for people when they've got no voice. You speak for people when they've got no voice. Yes, my dad's favourite hymn, um, I think St. Paul says in one of his letters, be thankful. Be thankful. And sometimes we need to remind ourselves what we should be thankful about, because we've always got something to be thankful about. My dad's story... Initially, it was a very sad story. He was um, brought up in a council estate in Chesterfield, in the Midlands, in England. His mum died when he was three. He had an elder and a younger brother, and his mum died tragically <coughs> when he was three. Um, his two brothers went to be adopted by one set of grandparents, but my dad stayed with his father, who married again very quickly, uh, a very young girl who uh, fell pregnant very quickly and to be honest she couldn't cope and um, she started taking it out of my dad and beating him up. He'd be a grieving child, not easy to look after, I can understand that. Um, you need skilled counsellors to cope with that and she started knocking him about and it got worse and worse until his arm was broken and the NSPCC came in and the case went to court and um, it looked very likely as if the stepmother would get a custodial sentence. The judge would send her to prison. Um, but my dad's grandmother, this was 1930s, sort of went into the court and started taking the judge on. Like the Syrophoenician woman in the Gospels who sort of took Jesus on about her sick daughter. And she made a sort of plea bargain with the judge and said, look, but obviously a stepdaughter, a daughter-in-law rather, had done wrong. But she was pregnant and if we sent her to prison then that would ruin everybody's life. So how about this? But if a daughter-in-law and a son moved away from Chesterfield and she would adopt a little boy, my dad, and bring him up and soothe him, would the judge agreed to that. And amazingly, it did agree. And the deal was done. And the grandmother, true to her word, brought up my dad. And soothed him. And it was, you know, nightmare stuff to start with, I think. And she soothed the nightmares. And took him to church. And my dad was blonde-haired and blue-eyed. I'm sure they all made a big fuss of his little boy. And the church was a Anglo-Catholic, very high church, the church became his life. The church became his life. And he always wanted to serve God full-time. He was only allowed from a, a council estate, he'd obviously had a rough life, and ordination wasn't on the cards. You know, to really, in those days, go to Oxford or Cambridge uh, to stand much of a chance. And he left school at 14. No one there was nothing. He went into the church army, which is a sort of lay ministry, a sort of full-time lay ministry operating within the Anglican Church. And um, he served in the church army for a while. And then 
he worked in a parish and the vicar said, well, I think you ought to be ordained. And my dad had to do his O-levels. I remember I was three and I used to play around his feet as he was sort of revising for his O-levels. Can't many people who have a three-year-old revising, uh, sitting at the feet when they're revising for their O-levels. But he got four O-levels, got to theological college and got ordained. He was an old man when he got ordained. He was aged 32. And in those days, he was the oldest person at theological college. I went there with my mum. I was six. and. Uh, he got ordained. And the church where, where he'd gone to as a little boy, which really fired his vocation, for his ordination, bought him this stone. And I always think that's the sort of marker of how love can come to the rescue. Even the most dire situation, love can come to the rescue. It's a red stone, the colour of blood. And you wear red stoles during Passion Week because you think about Christ going through all he went through. And you also wear red stoles at um, times when you celebrate the Holy Spirit with Sunday. And so it's a double thing. It's about inspiration and God being in suffering. And it's very warm now because my dad wore it. I've worn it um, ever since he gave up ministry. And it's just a marker, as I say, of how far loves of God's love can go to come to our rescue. And now thank you all our God, who from our mother's arms have blessed us on our way. My dad lost his mum when he was three, but he found another mum who rescued him. God bless you in all the mothering that you do. So we stand now. <laughs>